Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the uh, UFC card for tomorrow, May 21st. And it is an 11 uh, fight slate, and that already makes it kind of a semi fishy GPP slate in that it's going to be very difficult to, to uh, get a full takedown. That's okay. Um, there's nothing wrong with, uh, with a slate that makes it hard to get a complete takedown because you can split it with a couple of people and still have a really good, uh, really good day. But it does emphasize the, the need to at least minimize the amount of duplicate lineups that are out there. Um, this is a very, very difficult card. And, and one of the reasons for that, I want to I want to show you kind of a visual here. Um, these are my sheets for the MMA card. This is DraftKings. And for those of you that have seen these before, um, you know what these are. For those of you watching this for the first time, this is just kind of the way I rank things uh, by this thing called Sheets Value Score, which you really don't want to get into how that's all calculated. But what, what's really interesting is if you look at the rankings by Sheets Value Score, and then you look at the projected ownership, I mean, you'll see that it's, it's pretty... <laughs> It looks pretty damn efficient, right? That the best plays as I have them ranked are the highest owned. Now you might think, you know, duh, of course, but sometimes in some sports, you'll get some, some inefficiencies, but in MMA, especially this week, it looks really difficult. So like, for example, you have the two highest owned fights, um, uh, Almeida and Jakani. Um, they're both at 50%. And then after that, you have um, Holly Holm from the main event, 36%, right? You have, even if you go down to the highest owned underdog, you have Vieira in the main event. And, and, and it makes it a challenge to create lineups that are not going to be overduped. Um, by the way, the reason why these two are the highest stone, we'll get to it, but they just have the, the, the best KO upside, uh, the best finishing upside of pretty much everybody on the slate by a decent amount. And, and you'll also see that, you know, there isn't someone on the slate that has incredible grappling upside to overcome the lack of an inside the distance prop. So that's why these two fighters, Almeida and, and Injukani, are rating to be so highly owned. So what what you need to do in creating lineups is is is, is really think about the the push and pull between getting unique and and creating lineups that have no chance to win right i mean i could create lineups that are unique that are just horrible ev lineups right um so it's it, that's always the battle in these short slates is is figuring out Figuring out a lineup construction or a portfolio of lineups that has a shot to be the top scorer and yet also has a ch shot to not chop it with 8 million people. And it's very difficult. Um, but I do think that what this card has going for it is the lack of, of, of high upside fighters. Okay. Um, it, it, because it, it tests the usual construction, like the usual construction is, okay, I, I want to get the, the high finishing upside, get some grappling, and then just kind of just, just go from there. There really aren't that many just total smash plays. Um, so I, I found looking at this card, I mean, particularly challenging. And, and I looked at it quite a bit this week. Um, I, I absorbed all the content that I usually do. And one of these days I'll go over who I look to for outside content. Um, in addition to my instincts and the, the numbers and things like that. Um, and I do want to go fight by fight, but I think I have some, I don't want to say unique, because that, that overstates it, but maybe some ideas that if you've looked at this slate already, you haven't thought of. And if you have, maybe I'll agree with that or whatever. We'll, we'll, we'll get to it. So one thing I have noticed also is that 
we, we sometimes stray from the fundamentals a little bit too egregiously. So I do want to get back to the actual approach, right? So, so, so again, what we're looking for, fighters with good inside the distance props, meaning fighters with, you know, a likelihood to, to finish uh, and fights that have a likelihood to finish if you want to keep both sides. We also are looking for perhaps fighters with kind of some implied win odds. In other words, if a, if a, if a, if a fight is mispriced uh, early in the week as a result of late line movement, that that's, that's kind of always fun to, to take advantage of looking for good grappling upside uh, because of the way DraftKings scores. And obviously, you know, we, uh, we're looking for a good high pace, uh, high pace fight. Now, a lot of the things that I already said that I said that we're looking for is embedded within the projections. But the thing is, is don't forget the projections that are putting up there are median projections. And the thing about MMA projections is it's almost impossible to actually obtain your median projection, right? Because of the binary nature of MMA, you're either going to win or you're going to lose. And if your median projection is say 50, is say 50, 55, it's almost, it's just not likely it ever hits it. So it's really strange that the, um, I don't even understand how these projections could pretend to be median projections. Cause if you told me these were mean projections, like the average, I will at least realize that that's what it is. I mean, you, you if let's say you're either going to get 75 in a win or 25 in a loss. Yeah. Your mean is 50, but to say your median is 50, I, I don't even, uh, it doesn't even seem biz- accurate in a way, but the thing is we're comparing apples to apples. So these projections are all kind of mis, mis, uh, misaligned uh, equally. So I think that's okay. But what we are, again, what we're looking for though, is the difference between two different medians, like, like one fighter that might have just more upside from that. Um, and that's what we're looking for in GPPs. The other thing about this card is that um, where in a 15 fight card, you really need to find that huge upside result. I do think that in an 11 fight card, if you could get six winners, I mean, that you're already freaking gold. Okay. Um, so with that in mind, let, let's, let's go through the card and let's just stick to fundamentals and see if we can't come up with something. So first fight of the night, uh, I actually I don't even know if this is actually the first fight of the night. Cause they always mess around with the order, but Elise Reed versus Sam Hughes, you have a, you have a women's fight here. And it, it looks like, you know, it's a pretty competitive fight. You know, one's a 155 favorite, 135 on the other side. And it is just I like to double check this. It is being priced accurately, right? Given just the equity of the win equity. Um, let's take a look at the, the, um, the, uh, the finishing upside and all that stuff. Fight doesn't go to decision is really, really poor here. It's, it's minus 300 to go to decision. And that's, that's really not what you want. And then you have, as far as grappling upside, I suppose Sam Hughes, the Sam Hughes side has a bit of an advantage there. Um, just, I guess, because from her last fight, she won the fight exactly like this, right? She had two takedowns and basically held Nunez down the next, you know, the, the last two or three rounds, the last two rounds, and that was going to be enough. Um, the thing is, though, is that um, those are the only two takedowns I see in her entire board here. So um, I'm not sure that she gets an edge as far as that goes either. Um, the other thing I kind of look for is kind of embedded kind of industry bias. And this is like kind of good instincts I've had in MMA over the last like year or two doing this is, is there anybody, is there any take that's so universally held by the industry that's just not reflected in the odds for some reason. I always look at that as with, with a great degree of suspicion and trying to go the other way. And I don't think that's the case in this fight. I, I think that if anything, I mean, there's enough, I, I really think that, that, that the right amount of people are, are on Elise Reed, the right amount of people are on Sam Hughes. So I really don't see that big of an edge in this fight. So the only reason I would play this is if I saw the ownership was going to be extremely low. And unfortunately, it's not. I mean, you have 24% on one side, you know, give or take, right? 
and then 20% on the other. Um, so it doesn't seem like this fight is something I want to target. So if I get to this fight, it's really going to be by accident. All right, uh, Philippe Caloris versus Chase Hooper. Let's again, just go right back to basics. We have a $1.80 favorite versus a $1.55 underdog. Let's first look at the, at, the, um, at the salaries and let's just make sure that we're in the right game here. Um, yep, 8,600 to 7,600 looks relatively fair. Um, let's, uh, let's look at the finishing upside. Um, you have fight doesn't go to decision of about a pick em. Now, now normally I would say that's, that's kind of poor, but as you'll see in a card like this, that's actually not that bad. Okay. Um, so the next thing I want to see is there's any, is there any, you know, slant, you know, is one guy that much more likely than the other to get the finish? And I don't think so. It says, Hooper wins side wins inside the distance plus three eighty, Claris wins side the, inside the distance plus two twenty five. So they're about the same relative to their price. So there's no imbalance there. Um, now with respect to uh, to win condition and things like that, Chase Hooper does have some submissions um, on his record. So you could argue that. Cooper's win condition is very strong that if in fact he wins, it's a little more likely he gets that sub. But then again, I've, I've heard some good cases made that there's another way that Chase Cooper can win, which is using his height and reach advantage and just basically trying to pin Caloris to the cage and just kind of drape him a little bit, um, which is not really that great for, for DFS. But you know what? Remember that Chase Hooper's an underdog, and in a card like this where we're starved for underdogs, I'll really take any any win, you know what I mean, from these guys. So overall, I think that the the above average, I guess, finishing uh, upside for both these fighters, because it's pick them, and I think on this fight that's going to be good enough, makes this fight something that's probably worth targeting, you know? So, so do I have an opinion on one or the other? No, I think both their, both fighters win conditions are pretty, are, are pretty satisfied by, uh, by the score. In other words, I think if Kolaris wins, it's going to be because he gets a lot of volume in and probably get a good enough score. Um, and if Hooper wins, you know, he's got that sub upside and I, I don't really care too much about his win condition at his price. So I think it's a very fair fight. I think I would consider both sides, but it's funny that in, in a, in a card like this, which is star for value, I really want to try to find these underdogs if I can. Um, so I do feel as though Hooper is, is right. For example, compared to Sam Hughes, probably a better underdog because of that sub upside, because of the slightly better, you know, uh, the inside the distance prop and things like that. So I think Hooper's definitely in play as an underdog. And I do think Kolaris is in play just because, again, as a, this, this pick em finishing upside is probably good enough on a, on a slate like this. Um, Morales against Martinez. Let's, again, look. Uh, you got a minus 230 against a plus 190. And let's, again, let's take a look at the, at the pricing here. Um, seems fair enough price-wise, 8,900, 7,300. Um, so... With respect to the inside the distance prop, let's take a look at it. Yeah, so fight doesn't go to decision. It's like minus 200 to go to decision, which is very, it's pretty poor. So that's why you get Jonathan Martinez is probably something of a fade, you know, um, the, the, as, as the favorite. The only thing I would say is this, all right, and, and this is, this is what makes this fight, I think, kind of sneaky. Um, one thing that's been very common over this past week is, is this kind of narrative, this kind of analysis that Jonathan Martinez is an extremely good leg kicker. And apparently Vince Morales is extremely poor at defending them. So this edge is going to be extremely strong for Martinez. 
And what's going to result is that Martinez is just going to keep him at range, you know, kick him, you know, in the feet, in the leg enough and just kind of grind out a kind of an easy decision. But listen, everybody gets, gets paid to read the same stuff. So I'm sure that Morales' camp knows this also. And I would like to think that Morales worked on exactly that, you know, and, and, and MMA analysis is not exactly that easy. You know, we, we thought this was going to happen last week, right? When Maximoff was just going to take down this freaking Petrovsky and just going to just grub, just bury him. But the other guy gets paid too, man. You know, he gets the, he gets the plan also. And it resulted in, in a, in a submission, you know, in the first round, the other way. So I would say that the, 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 there are two ways you could do this. First of all, you could certainly play Morales as, as an underdog. Again, if, if that's, the, if that's the clear path to Martinez and let's say Morales, that's the one thing he's got to stop. If he could stop that one thing, then he's all of a sudden in this fight, you know, and if he's in this fight, anything can happen as the underdog. So, you know, remember, if Jonathan Martinez is going to just keep him at reins and, and just not really do much except for a leg kick him and, you know, whatever, you know, it doesn't take a lot to turn that fight around, especially in the eyes of the judges, because judges don't like boring fights, you know. And, and if Morales gets in a couple of really good shots, that could overcome about 37 leg kicks, you know. So I do think Morales is, is, is certainly live in this spot as an underdog. I I didn't have it in me to take the ultra contrarian approach. Now the ultra contrarian approach was going to say, you know what, I'm just going to take Martinez because, 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 you know, he's priced just alongside these other guys with a more upside. So maybe he goes solo owned that everybody subscribes to that narrative um, that he can only win that kind of decision. Um, and maybe he gets a KO and nobody owns him. But I'm looking at his ownership, and even this is 23%. So I mean, the ownership is not low enough for me to make that kind of stylistic uh, conclusion. So I do think Morales is live, uh, and I don't, I really, and I am going to fade uh, Martinez. So let's look at Morales, Omar Morales versus, uh, this is different Morales versus Uros Medic. And this fight is okay, so you have a minus 140 for Morales. Um, plus 120 for Medic, and I think it's being priced accordingly. Let's just double check that. Yeah, Morales is a slight favorite over Medic, and um, yeah, it makes sense. But you look at the inside the distance prop here. I mean, this is a minus 255, and on, on a card like this, this is enormous. So this is this is a really this, this fight is, is really something you have to play, I think, because not only do you have this minus 255, again, you know, uh, fight doesn't go to decision, but if you look at the price tags of these guys, you know, the um, uh, 78 versus 8,400, if those, if, if that fight does finish, which it rates to, it's extremely likely that the winner of this fight ends up in the optimal. So I think that right off the bat, this fight is the first fight that if you're playing two lineups, for example, that you should make sure to lock in and play both sides. Um, I don't have a particular opinion on who's going to win, but this, those, those numbers on a card like this are extremely difficult to ignore. So I would start with that. And the only reason I wouldn't play it is if the ownership was going to be so high. And, and I mean, quite honestly, I'm looking at it and I see Morales at, you know, at 30%, which is okay. You know, it's a, it's a lot, but it's not, it's not as chalky as some of these others and the other side of it, um, Medich at only 23%. That, that looks like a very, very fair, fair ownership price for a fight that, you know, he's only, he's barely a pickup. He's barely an underdog. And if he wins, it's almost likely, I mean, he's almost definitely going to be the optimal. So I don't know. It, it looks good to me. Um, all right. Uh, moving on uh, Almeida versus Parker Porter. I do think this fight has been overanalyzed. Okay. I, I've, I've heard more takes about what a live underdog Parker Porter is than I can, uh, that I can stomach, but, the, but he's a 600 up, but Almeida is minus 600. I mean, Porter's that great of an underdog. It just wouldn't be plus 400 or right? it's ridiculous. I really think this is fight's been overanalyzed. I, what people are saying is that, is that Almeida is giving up like 40 pounds to Parker Porter. 
So he's really just not that much of a lock. And even though he's got incredible grappling and a great wrestler and all that stuff, he's not going to be able to take Porter down. But the fact of the matter is he's a minus 600 favorite. The fight doesn't go to a decision line as minus 450. I mean, it's, 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 it's a pick them to even start round two. Okay. I mean, he's plus 225 to win by KO. He, he's, he's, a, he's minus 110 to win by submission. He's favored to finish the dude. And that people are fading him. I, I'm, I am not. Okay, so you can give me all your all all of the all the narratives and all the reasons to try to be a pain in the neck. I'm just there's no way I'm doing this. I I I will play Almeida. I will trust the numbers. I will trust Vegas. And you know this this guy, given these metrics, given the minus six hundred or whatever. Look, Maximoff was 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 um well, maybe he was more like minus minus a thousand whatever it is but whenever you see fights like this the guy's 9600 and he's a hundred percent owned and and in this fight i mean look he's he's it it does look as though he's going to be 50 percent owned but i think that's too little on a, on a card like this i mean where's the where's the finishing upside going to come from you know we go through the rest of this card i mean this dude's a, a pick him to finish in like the first round pretty much you know what I mean? So that's like a hundred freaking points, 50% of the time off the bat. That's not even considering the fact that he might get two takedowns and, 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 and you know, and, and submit them and get some ground and pound. I mean, you can get a hundred, you can get 120 points here and an 11 cut fight, 11 fight card without a lot of upside. I mean, like 125 points, you can't fade that. So for me, I'm, I'm not going to be a pain in the neck. I'm not fading this. I'll be with the field at least, if not over it, on, on Almeida. Um, and if Porker wins, Porker, <laughs> that, was, that was pretty bad. Um, I didn't mean Porker, even though he's he's kind of heavy set. If Porter wins, he's uh, yeah, I, he's stuck. I don't think he's gonna have my money. All right, Joseph Holmes versus Alan Amadovsky. So let's take a look at the um, at the uh, the numbers here. You have, okay, a minus 195, 165. So again, let's just double check and make sure that these odds are reflected in the price properly. Yeah, 8,800, 7,400, sounds about right. Um, let's go back and look at the inside the distance props. Well, this is pretty good, man, minus 250. So minus 250, fight doesn't go to decision. I, I, isn't that very similar to this Medich fight, right? almost exactly the same. The only thing that makes this kind of a weaker fight is that the price is not as crunched, right? So the Medich Morales, for example, remember was 8,400 versus 7,800. And this one is 88 by 74. Um, but here is, again, you, you have an industry take here. Um, it's, it's, they're saying it's low level. I don't trust them. I mean, th these are just words that, that don't mean anything. You know what I mean? Because the odds are what they are. Um, so I wouldn't worry about the level or anything like that because it's low level for one, low level for the other. And, and I'm, I'm willing to take shots that, that this is fight is almost as good as the, as the managed Morales fight. Let me just make sure that there's not one, one of these guys that's that much more likely. I mean, look at this for example. So you have, this is almost crazy. So you have Holmes to win by TKO. Well, actually, plus 275 to win by TKO is plus 200 win a submission. Actually, you have Holmes winning inside the distance is about a pick em. And even Aramadovsky winning inside the distance, distance is plus 300. So either of these guys is extremely live, you know, and, and they both, both of their win conditions are extremely strong for draft for, for for upside so this is another fight where i am i am going to attack this and i'll and i'll go for both sides of this one um so viana versus richie so this is a, a totally other way to go as far as dfs and we'll, we'll talk about this so let's look at the odds first you have richie at 135 and you have so pollyanna viana is about you know a little bit a little bit of underdog so i would imagine it would be richie what, 84 versus 78? Let's take a look and see what exactly what it is. You have, um, uh, where is it? 
Yeah, 83.79, very similar. Um, let's take a look at the inside the distance prop. And as with most, most women's fights, you're not going to get a really good inside the distance line. Although it's not as bad as some. You know, you, you actually have almost a pick em, which is very interesting. You know, because of the, 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 of the pricing here, right? You want to really think about this. The, the, the other thing about this fight is from a style perspective, it becomes very interesting because Tabitha Ritchie is probably going to go for takedowns, which as we all know is good for DraftKings scoring. And Pollyanna Vienna is, is very content to try to get submissions off of her back, um, which she's done before. So if you're giving both fighters the opportunity to get in their win condition, um, which are both really good for drafting scoring, I think this is a really, really good fight, you know, because, you know, the, the, the pricing is really, really good. It allows you to do a lot of things. And both of the fighters' win conditions are really, really strong. So I really, I really like this fight quite a bit. And I would, I would certainly go for both sides of this. Um, Park versus Anders. So you have a minus 200 favorite from Park. And it's probably going to be priced what? What does that mean? Like 91, like 9,700? Let's see. Let's predict that for you. Yeah, 9,700. And... Let's uh, let's take a look at the uh, inside the distance prop here. Inside the distance prop is kind of poor, you know. It, it's it's minus one seventy five to go to the decision for a nine k fighter. That's some um, that's a little rough. I mean, the only thing I would say is that Park does have some degree of grappling upside, so maybe that overcomes that a little bit. But overall, I would say that is one of the is not a preferred option for me um, at nine k. I feel as though some of these other fighters we've talked about already just have a lot more, a lot more upside, like like the Joseph Holmes or the um, uh, what you call it, or even the Morales Medich fight, the winner of that fight, or certainly Almeida, whatever. Um, so it's possible that that uh, that park can win kind of a, a, a boring, low scoring decision, which obviously is very poor at, at 9K. And now that kind of flies in the face of what I said, right, about you need winners. But at 9K, you know, you need to do better than that, because remember, for every 9K you, you, you use, you probably have to use a 7K. You know what I mean? Sort of. You know, I hope you understand how that works. So. I think that Park is probably one of the weaker of the of the high priced fighters here. Um, so that's where I am on that. And, and, and Anders, I don't see much of a, uh, you know, the wind condition is not really good. The the inside the distance prop is kind of poor. Um, if, it, if he wins, that's really. You know, like I said, at 7K, if he wins, I don't really care what his, what his, what his, uh, what his uh, upside is. So maybe I'll throw him in, you know, the underdog pool. Because, look, I mean, he's plus 160 just like these others, just like just like Hooper, just like um, even, you know, even Sam Hughes or whatever. Um, so he certainly has a shot. He's going to win about 35, 40 percent of the time. Um, and if he does, he's probably going to be hitting the optimal. So, um, so yeah, um, that's where I am on that fight. Okay. So moving on to this, uh, next fight, uh, Chidi, uh, Njukwani versus, uh, Dusko, uh, Todorovic. So you have Njukwani, he's a minus 200 and Dusko is about plus 180. So again, we're probably talking about Maybe, you know, 9,207K, something like that. Let's take a look here. Um, ooh, you actually have a pretty pretty undervalued fighter here. So you have Enjukani at 8,700. Let's go back and look at that again. Yeah, so he's up to like minus 240. Um, that's that's kind of underpriced. 
um, compared to some of these others that we talked about, right? So he's priced this, he's priced less than, than, than Park, who's only, only a minus 200. He's priced, well, he's priced the same as Martinez. This is why, one of the reasons why Park is very, very poor win equity play here, actually. Um, so, I mean, you compare him to Martinez, though. Like, let's look at this fight. I mean, this is a look at the inside the distance prop here. Here you have an inside the distance prop of minus 250, which is really strong. Um, it is it's similar to some of these others we talked about, like the Medich. Um, the what was the other one that was like that? The Medich fight and the Holmes fight. Um, but this is interesting. So you wow, this is not kind of interesting. You have and Jaquani with a he's a plus 110. He's a pick him to win by TKO. In other words, his in pretty much his entire win condition is is getting that finish. And so basically 50% of the time he's getting probably 90 points plus. So 50% of the time he's in the optimal, which is why he's very very highly owned. But I will say that to Dorovich has first of all he's got a plus 600 ko prop and the other thing that he has he does have have wrestling upside um uh, which first first of all i'm not going to need a win condition for him uh if he wins at 7k or 7300 um but it helps to have that kind of grappling upside and it's also possible however unlikely that you know, that this fight doesn't finish and he gets grappling and he ends up losing. You know, he could end up grappling through two rounds and then get KO'd in the third and still make the optimal. It's possible. Um, the other thing I would say is that from an industry perspective, they are just piling on the Enjaquani side. Because the narrative here is that is that Enjaquani hits really hard, and that Todorovic just doesn't defend himself, right? And and those co the combination of those two things means that Enjaquani is just going to knock his face in. But once again, I mean, Dusko's a human being, right? <laughs> he's got a camp, he's got trainers. They certainly know this, and they know that that Enjaquani hits hard. What do you think they're going to do? Well, you know, we don't care. Just go ahead and stick your face in his fist. Oh, they're going to plan for this. And and it's not so easy to say, okay, so now Andrew Quine should knock his head off. Uh, if I were the trainer of, of, of Dusko, I would say, you know what? Go for takedowns. You know what I mean? You're not going to you're not gonna stand there and put your face in the way of his fist. So go for takedowns. And and if that's the case, you know, that's 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 kind of a tough fight for uh, Andrew Quine to win at huge chalk. So Yes, according to the numbers, uh, you definitely do have to play uh, Andrew Klani. I mean, that prop is too big. But I'm definitely going to play some of this other one, you know. So he's going to be, I don't know what his ownership looks like, but whatever it is, it's going to be lower, I think, because the industry has been pounding the other side of this fight, like the whole week. Um, like right now, what does it say? It, he is a, He's 16%. It might even be lower than that. So I am definitely going to be playing him. Okay, Pahea versus uh, Ponzinibbio. Um, this is the co-main event. And people like to play this. Uh, but let's really take a look and see if this is worth playing. You know, So you have basically a pick em fight. Uh, Pahea is a little bit of a favorite. So I would imagine it would be 85 to 77, 84 to 78, something like that. Let's take a look um 82 to 8 that, actually that's that's fair enough right um let's just make sure that is fair enough uh 82 they okay maybe maybe pay is a little bit undervalued here in the DraftKings uh price um if he's minus 140 probably should be closer to 8500 and he's only 82 so maybe you're getting a little bit of uh of win equity in him right but let's go and look at the inside the distance prop here. Um, fight doesn't go to decision about a pick them. All right. So not, it's about the same as this other one is this um, Colares Hooper fight. We thought that was kind of okay at pick them. 
And so I don't think the Pahea fight's any better. So for me, uh, I regard this as very similar to Hooper Kolaris, except for the fact that that the pricing of the Kolaris Hooper fight is 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 not as tight. You know, you can't just take both sides of that so easily. Where here you can. So if anything, in this fight, I probably wouldn't take the Ponzinibbio side just because I think Pahea does have that extra little bit of win equity um, because of the pricing. So for me, I mean, the inside of this is probably sort of poor. Um, I would say it's sort, of, sort of poor, it's pick them. But because this is the co-main event, I mean, this is going to probably garner more ownership than, than say, that Kolaris fight. Um, let's take a look. Um, actually, it does look like the Kolaris fight is getting quite a bit of ownership. So maybe I, I'm wrong about that. So, yeah, it looks like Pahea and his opponent are actually not getting played that much. So, so yeah, I, I actually wouldn't mind this, but but I would take the Pahea side, just that little win equity just does kind of make a difference. So I, I would play one lineup, I would put him, I probably wouldn't use Ponzinibbio. And if I was playing, you know, multiple lineups, I, I would lean more on Pahea than Ponzinibbio. And then in the main event, you have Holly Holm against Kate and Vieira, Vieira. And uh, we have, Home at minus 250, Vieira at plus 200. So I'm expecting about, yeah, about 90, 9,100 by 7,100, something like that. And that's exactly what it is, 9,100 by 7,100. Um, the inside of the distance prop is not going to be good, right? Women's MMA, it's probably about to pick them. Actually, not even. It's, it's plus 165 to make it through five rounds. So... so um, you have the normal analysis, right? With the five round fight, you know, you just have just that many more rounds to accumulate fantasy points, which is why this fight is going to be, you know, it's going to be owned. Um, I don't think either fighter has that much grappling upside. We have seen it out of both these fighters, actually. Vieira has some takedowns. Holly Holm, even in one of her most recent fights, had some takedowns. So you have a little bit from both sides. Um but um, I don't see much of an edge here. You know, I, I haven't, one thing I will say is that for a minus 250 favorite, I think the overall um, picks of the industry is more like 20 to one for home. I have not really heard a take that actually predicts Vieira to win, you know, and, and, and at, you, you're supposed to hear a little bit more when you're a 200 underdog. Like you'll find people that, you know, that are um, find more people that are picking Parker Porter to win. How about that? Than Vieira. Um, you find more people picking Vince Morales to win than Vieira. And not that Vince Morales is a bad play. I, I like it, but 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 nobody is 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 actually coming out and saying that they like Vieira to win this fight, which to me is a little bit fishy. So I have no problem just making kind of a weird industry fade play and just play Vieira as one of my underdogs. Um, is it going to be my favorite underdog? I don't know, maybe, you know, five rounds to work with. You know, I've, I've done this before, you know. I mean, I've played against Holly Holm. I've bet against her before, and it, it really hasn't worked out too well. Like, when, when did I play against her? I think it was – I think it was her last fight. Yeah, it was, it was, it was against Aldana. She was, again, she was a – I think she was a pretty big favorite. I don't know why there's no salary here. She was a pretty big favorite and I played against her. Actually, it wasn't even that big of a favorite and she kicked the crap out of her. I mean, Aldana was just, had no shot. Like at no point did I feel the slightest bit competitive. So I don't know how much I would love to fade this, but she is 40. She's coming off a seven month layoff, which is either good or bad. You know, if you're, if you're, if you're 40, you don't want to fight every week anyway. So I don't know. I'll probably end up being a wimp and just playing both sides of this. Because um, I, I know by the instinct in me says just to play more Vieira. Um, but I guess I'm still stung from having that same logic earlier when I played Aldana. And literally, I mean, if you watch that fight, I mean, within two seconds, you knew you had no chance. And it was just a constant grind. I don't know if she, I don't think she, I don't think she lost the round. 154 significant strikes and five takedowns. Yikes. 133 fantasy points. I mean, maybe that's just what you're supposed to do. You're just supposed to take Holly home. You know, 
she's the goat. You know, she'd be Rousey when no one thought she would. And she just comes back and just does her thing. Look, she lost to Nunez, but aside from that, I mean, she's done nothing wrong in the last like five years. So I don't know. Maybe you're supposed to take Holly home and be done with it. Uh, I'm really honestly not sure what to do with this one. So that's overall my takes. Um, you know, I, hopefully I've identified some, some fights for you to target, some fights for you to fade. Um, I guess the Elise Reed fight is something I'm probably going to have zero of. I think that I can't, I can't play everything. So I'm probably going to avoid that park fight. And if he ends up getting a million takedowns, then, then so be it. Probably going to fade the, the Ander side of the park fight as well. Um, well, actually, I'm probably going to fade the whole fight. And I'm just not going to be, I'm not going to go in for the Porter thing. You know, I'm just not going to do it. Um, you could build, by the way. I mean, if you really didn't want to play somebody like uh, uh, Almeida at 9,600, you could make a good lineup with, with just a whole bunch of these middlers, you know, like uh, the Medich Morales fight, the, um, the Richie fight, the uh, Todorovic fight. I mean, these, these middling fights, you can really make a good lineup out of all these guys without really having to play the 9,400 uh, if you wanted to. Um, so overall, I, I think that you can get, get unique by, you could, you could leave some money on the table. Maybe if you fade the main event, you're always going to be unique. And one thing you could do is you, you could, you could play to Dorovich because you get, you get, <laughs> you get double leverage off of a really high owned guy, you know, in, in Jukani and the, the path is there, you know? If they say styles make fights, if in fact Dorovic can go to that wrestling and get it done, he's going to win. You know what I mean? And if he wins and you get 50% in Jaquani ownership, just going in down the toilet, you know, that's, uh, that's huge. So listen, is he going to win? Probably not. But if he does, we're heroes. And that's what you got to think about with these odds. Um, all right. That will do it. Uh, good luck, everybody. And I uh, hope somebody takes a 10.